But today we are in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 8 and go to the end of the chapter. It says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectful apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman, a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. You know, first Paul returns to the topic of prayer and, and gives us, uh, good morning Robert, uh, gives us some positive directions and says, I desire, and this was not a demand, it was a, I desire, a longing that all men should pray. They should pray in, in every place. Any place that you are, you are to pray. You can and should pray in that place. Where there is a need, prayer's in order. There's a need in our society right now for prayer, and prayer's in order. Prayers at the churches are not any more acceptable and holy. And sometimes you see a need and we pray. You know, sometimes though, if we're not careful, we, we say, well, we, we need to pray more at church. We, we see a need for prayer more and it has to be done in the church. And well, why isn't the church having more prayer meetings? And why isn't the church getting together? Well, I'll tell you why. Um, you know, our church had a Wednesday night prayer that met all the time. We had a Sunday morning prayer group. And can I tell you that right now, there are only two people that come, myself and one others that come early on a Sunday morning at about 8.30 till about, nine, um, our service starts at 9 now. So actually, I guess he comes at 8.15. And we both, that, in, on our own, walk around the church and pray. There's two of us now. And that's not just a pandemic thing, because before the pandemic, there was only three of us that met for prayer. So we want to gripe and we want to say, well, the church needs to be more about prayer. And that pastor needs to have more prayer meetings. <laughs> and yet we don't come. We don't come. We don't pray. And that's okay, because you don't have to be in the church to pray. You can be at home and pray. You can be in the grocery aisle and pray, or you can be, I, I don't know why, but the last, uh, we have a, an individual in our church that needs some prayer right now who's in the hospital, and I found myself uh, um, two nights ago, it was 1.30 in the morning waking up praying for her, and last night it was 3.30 in the morning that I wake up and pray for her, for her healing, and for God to show up. But we so often want to just point and say, well, the church needs more prayer. We need to pray more in the church. And yet Paul's saying the truth is we need the church, the body of Christ, to pray wherever they're at, to pray everywhere, to be more about prayer, because prayer links heaven and earth. Prayer links the kingdom of God in heaven to be here on earth. He then says, lifting holy hands, Holy hands that are not w without wrath. God doesn't demand a posture. He doesn't demand us to pray a certain way. He demands a character in our lives. Uplifting hands suggest reverence. It, it suggests adoration. It suggests dependence supplication, submission, expectancy. That's what's demanded of us, that when we pray, we pray with reverence and awe for God, that we pray with adoration for who he is, that we pray with full-on dependence, that if God doesn't show up, then woe is us. We need God to show up, that we pray with full supplication before him, submitting to his will, 
and expecting that he actually will work. That it's not just a whole hum thing that, well, we got to get through 2020. I, you know, people back in June were saying, oh, I can't wait for this year to get over. Well, quit waiting and pray for God to show up and to use you in spite of it. To reach out to your neighbors and your community and your world. He says that these hands must be free of wrath. They must be free of, of unforgiven sin. Free from resentment against others. Free from doubt, lack of faith. We must trust God. Paul was not then stating that women couldn't pray, right? You know, because he, he mentions men and men should do this and women should do that. He wasn't stating that women shouldn't pray or couldn't pray. Remember, Timothy served in Ephesians and in Ephesus. And in Ephesians, we find some other passages and um, similar speaking against women. And it was because of the background, the cultural background in that area of a cult to um, Dionysus. There was a cult to Dionysus that was very disorderly, and all the women were priests, and all the women were in. And, and so he wasn't preaching against women, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, because as a Nazarene and as a holiness background, we believe in women in ministry. And it seems like this passage, which has been used to hurt often and cause hardships in our culture, um, has been used individually from the rest of Paul's scripture. There was a background. There was the background that women and children were often uneducated. And so maybe, you know, he you would rein in those who didn't know what they were talking about. I mean, we're not going to have somebody teach a Sunday school class that doesn't know how to read a commentary a little bit. You know, they don't have to be the wisest. They don't have to have a Bible degree, but they need to know where to get information so that they don't accidentally spout out heresies, right, and preach the wrong way and maybe even preach against the church. They need to at least know our, our beliefs as a church. Paul was not stating that women couldn't pray. Paul then begins to speak about modesty, right? Modesty and dress to dress modestly. Well, why? You know, some uh, some denominations, I had friends who were apostolic and, um, you know, the rules in the apostolic church are just kind of dependent on the pastor. And the pastor said, well, you can't have any jewelry because of this. You had to have long hair, it had to be braided, you couldn't wear jewelry or makeup, you know. But it was funny because his wife and daughter would always wear jewelry and would always wear makeup. It was okay for them, but others couldn't, right? You know, but but Paul was said you had to dress modestly. Well, why? Because the braids and the jewelry, they were signs of wealth. They were signs of status. And so you would come dressed to the hilt to show your wealth. It's kind of like Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor was known for her diamond ring, if you remember that. Her diamond ring was a 33-carat diamond ring that was worth $11.4 million. She wore it to flaunt wealth, to flaunt her position in society as one of the one percenters. They were an outward flaunt to seek personal praise. It's kind of, if you will, why the younger generations have gone away from suits in church. Fine dresses and hats, right? You still go into some denominations and hats are a big deal because it come, becomes about flaunting wealth. Flaunting your position, putting yourself above those that are poor that can't afford you know, the early Anglican church John Wesley kind of fought against was because they purchased their pews. And if you were poor, then you couldn't get a pew down on the floor. You had to sit in the balconies with slaves and with everybody else, the, the poor of society. And he made a fuss and almost got kicked out of the Anglican church when he personally purchased pews and brought in all the poor and set them in the front of the church. Oh, heaven forbid, right? And that was what happened with suits because the poor couldn't afford fine clothing. Think about that the next time you look down on somebody who walks into church poorly dressed. Maybe it's a financial thing. 
personally, I mean, I have a couple of suits and I wear them at funerals and weddings and all of that. But um, prior I didn't. And it was because I didn't want to spend, it's kind of like being in a wedding, you know, uh, you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on a dress you'll never wear again. That, that would be for the ladies. Obviously, I'm not wearing a dress. Okay. <laughs> don't get distracted. <laughs> you know, but, but a suit, I, spending all that money on a tuxedo that I'm only going to wear once and never get to wear again. No. You know, and, and we see that as being, not being wise, not being good stewards of our money. And so um, suits and hats and formal dresses that just don't have their place in church as much anymore. Not because we're being disrespectful to God, but because we don't want to flaunt positions in society. Paul instead says that good works should be what we are seeking. Putting others first. Putting others first above ourselves. You know, like I said, these verses have been used to cause hardships in the church in the past. We look at this scripture and without looking at all of them. You know, I had a professor one time who used to say any verse of the Bible preached by itself can be heresy. If we're not careful. Paul had multiple women in ministry with him. Phoebe, Junia, Lydia, Priscilla, others. Culturally, like I said, there was a cult in Ephesus that he was dealing with and speaking against. Women seeking to disrupt worship. Worship Diana, Dionysus, Diana. The Holy Spirit is a God of order and not disorder. And so if there's something that's causing disorder in the church, then you have to weed it out. Not allowed and anything with the church there. Paul was... seeking to create order. And as a Nazarene, we believe women can be in ministry and can lead. You know, I have many doctoral, because uh, this is a question that comes up a lot um, with those that are around us. Yeah, be there for Jesus, not a social club. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I have a file that I keep of different articles, doctoral thesis, those type of things on why we believe in women in ministry. And so I may not do the best job describing it right now. Um, and I'm going to try to give you a couple key things in a short matter of time. But if there's interest, I'd love to share that with you. Um, because even denominations that have said they don't believe in women in ministry, and I look at the Southern Baptist Church right now, some of their leaders are women. Priscilla Schreier, Beth Moore, are some of the most anointed preachers I know. And it's created harm and hurt when individuals in their own denomination have looked down on them and told them they have no right to be pastors. We create hardships in our church with the wrong view and not looking at the rest of Paul's ministry in Scripture. And so a couple of reasons why in the Wesleyan holiness view we believe in women being able to be ordained is um, it's not founded on modern feminism. It, it's not a feminist view at all. Um, you know, that's something, too, that we need to make sure that you understand. Uh, you know, Wesleyan holiness background, uh, the Methodist church, we, we were some of the forerunners in the women's rights movements. But women's rights movements back in the, that time, 17, 18, early 1900s, is not the feminism, the, the ultra-liberal feminism of today. It, it was a woman's right to vote, to to hold a job, to, to do things, to be a part of society and not expected to be silent, barefoot, and in the kitchen, right? It was not to see them as second-class citizens. And so in the Wesleyan holiness view, we see first the view of creation, that women are created equal as equal inheritors of God's image. And subsequent subjugation of women is a sinful consequence of the fall. Faith 
and new life in Christ restored the created intention of God and eliminated that distortion. Second, we believe in the public proclamation that both testaments record the faithful and fearless service of women, including prophets like Miriam and Deborah and Hulda and the Corinthian women who were told to cover their head when they prophesied. Jesus chose a woman as the first to hear his charge to proclaim his resurrection. Third, it's God's new order. The same Paul who told unruly women in Corinth and Ephesus to be quiet and worship declared that in Christ there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female in Galatians 3. Fourth, it's the Spirit's calling. Pentecost made it plain that God pours out his Spirit upon all flesh so that sons and daughters might prophesy. These scriptural premises provide what one individual, uh, Susie Stanley from Messiah College, called the prophetic authority and the empowerment of the Spirit that compels all God's people to serve and witness to His grace. My daughters have just as much right and ability to preach, to be missionaries. My niece is a missionary by herself. Not married, not with a husband. <laughs> she is an amazing missionary in her own right. And we believe wholeheartedly. Now, belief and practice are two different things. And I, I, I do bemoan the fact that often I was a part of a denomination uh, in the Wesleyan denomination in a district that did not know what it meant to have women in ministry. And one came along and she was fighting often to be seen on par with the other ministers. And that's sad. That's heartbreaking. In both the Wesleyan and the Nazarene, we have districts that are like that. That we say that we believe in it, but I don't ever want to serve alongside. And, and that's just not right. You know, my prayer is that we as individuals seek God's word, seek God's direction, because he can speak through all. If he can speak through a donkey, and he can speak through me, <laughs> he can speak through my daughters, as well as my sons. A spirit fell upon all flesh. The sons and the daughters can prophesy. So again, that's a quick five-minute doctoral thesis that is one of the most heated discussions. I have good friends that are in ministry and other denominations, and it breaks my heart. One who actually um, is looking to leave a holiness denomination and go to Southern Baptist because he just doesn't believe that women ought to preach. And it breaks my heart. Satan likes to divide the church and the body of Christ over non-dogma, non-key apostolic creed items. So again, if that's something that you question, I'd love to be able to share more research with you. But God, I just thank you that you call all men and women you call all. God, we sometimes point at verses that due to a masculine view in our society have been translated in the masculine, and yet they weren't intended to be that way. They weren't ever intended to be read in a male voice. They were a generic word. And yet we've translated it in masculine. And, and so, God, I pray that um, we would seek your spirit. Lord, your Holy Spirit can use all. God, we, we seek your spirit through prayer, what we first were talking about. 
that prayer coming before you in supplication, coming before you humbly, coming before you in reverence, coming before you submitting our beliefs, our thoughts, and our wills to your gospel, to your scripture, to hearing from your Holy Spirit. So God, we give our lives to you. We give ourselves to you. May we be a people of prayer. May we seek to pray without ceasing. God, not giving up because you've not stopped working. Lord, I thank you for the signs that are all around us that you have come to a weary world this year. God, honestly, I, I believe it's going to get worse. I think we've inflated the economy and that's going to crash. I think we have done so much harm and it's going to get worse. And if we've had difficulty trusting you this year, God, I pray for the church. Pray for strength, resilience in the face of evil. Strength in the face of calamity. Trust of your will and your plan in your hand, God. Lord, if this was a trial run and we have failed to trust you, Lord, show us. Speak to us. Because we want nothing more than to run this race with endurance, perseverance, so that when we cross that finish line, we hear those wonderful, amazing words of well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.